So uh, we're going to talk about the three generation of free NAS as uh, the most the world's most popular storage OS is now turned 12 years old. Uh, my name is Alan Jude, and as you might notice, I'm not Michael Dexter. <laughs> uh, I'm a FreeBSD committer and a member of the FreeBSD core team, which is the nine people elected by the body of 400 committers that make up the FreeBSD project uh, to be on its board of directors, basically. Uh, I wrote two books, uh, FreeBSD Mastery ZFS and uh, Advanced ZFS. So one of the main technologies behind FreeNAS is ZFS, and if you want to know more about that, you can check those out at zfsbook.com. I've written many articles for uh, the FreeBSD Journal, which is our six times a year technical journal, and we provide information about all the things happening in the BSD project. And I've spoken at a large number of different conferences like this one. Uh, and in my day job, <coughs> I manage about 1,000 terabytes of uh, ZFS-based storage devices. Uh, and I also do a weekly video podcast, uh, bsdnow.tv, where we interview uh, developers working on open source software and talk to them about various things and how they got started in getting into that uh, to try to help people who are new and interested in getting involved in open source to see paths other people have taken and how they ended up uh, in the positions they're in. And uh, I also did a uh, TechSnap podcast, which was uh, oriented towards sysadmins and security, uh, but I had to step down from that because doing two podcasts a week is a lot of work. <laughs> anyway, so FreeNAS. Uh, FreeNAS is a BSD licensed embedded storage OS. Uh, so you download it, put it on a little USB stick or whatever, plug it into any old computer, and it turns the drives in that computer into a network attached storage device. Uh, you get a web UI that you can use to manage it. So it's, you know, spouse and manager approved. And once you set it up and get it working for somebody, you don't have to be the only person that modifies the config from then on. Creating an extra share is just go into the web UI, create a share, click a couple buttons, and it's good to go. So it's a nice thing for kind of a set it and forget it, and, and they can continue to manage it. You don't have to do it all. Uh, and it's that easy, but it's still providing the full power of the renowned FreeBSD storage stack. So you can drop to a shell in it, and you have all the tools, and you can do anything you can do on FreeBSD. So basically, any 64-bit machine, uh, you can turn into a very powerful NAS. Uh, if you put it on certified hardware, it's also VMware, Hyper-V, and Citrix certified. So whether it's just for your home, you can put like Plex Media Server on it and stream to your TV, your small office where you don't want to buy an expensive server, or if you need something for enterprise to back your virtual desktop infrastructure, it can do all of that. So a little more generically, what is a network attached storage device? It's basically file-based storage, right? It's a file server. Uh, so you can share it with Samba so that Windows and, and other OS machines, you know, it's the most common protocol for sharing files. But it can also do NFS for Linux and BSD and, uh, you know, ESXi and other virtualizers like that. Uh, the Apple file protocol even. So if you have to support Macs, you can do that with their native file protocol. Uh, or web dev if you need, you know, calendar syncing and things like that. But it is also a SAN. So it can do iSCSI-based block storage. So if you want high performance for hosting multiple VMs and so on, you can do it that way. Or you can even boot machines off iSCSI. Apple has switched to using uh, SMB2. Yes. But some people have old Macs yeah, and no, refuse to get rid of them. <laughs> uh, so yes, most Mac OS users will choose to use SMB2 uh, because it's what everything else uses. But if you're using Hyper-V or uh, ESX, then iSCSI is going to be the most performant option for you. Um, and then Zen Server mostly uses NFS. So as far as what hardware you need to actually run it, recommend minimum is 8 gigs, but you can use less, but you shouldn't. Uh, so just any machine, you know, ECC RAM is always better, but not required. And then while the onboard SATA in your motherboard is probably good enough, if you want to support a lot of drives or if it's critical infrastructure, we recommend something like the LSI 9211 or uh, uh, 9207. Just a, a straight HBA rather than hardware RAID. We'll get into why in a minute. Uh, the other thing that the underlying file system ZFS provides is it has support for a, uh, a write store called a separate intent log, which allows you to take synchronous writes, things for like databases or NFS, where 
the application is asked for a guarantee that this data is on stable storage before the write call finishes. Uh, it can flush that to a very fast SSD um, to allow the application to continue its work, and then later it will flush that data out uh, asynchronously to the regular spinning hard drives, allowing you to have the performance without having to buy all SSDs to get the performance. <laughs> it also has a read cache called the L2 arc uh, that allows when stuff falls out of the VM cache, the virtual file system cache, in your operating system, it actually falls out to an SSD so that you can still get better performance by reading that data back from the SSD than from your spinning hard drives. And then, you know, uh, at least a gigabit of, of Ethernet is probably makes sense for a file server, uh, but FreeBSD has great support for 10, 20, 40, 50, and 100 gigabit network cards. So uh, Netflix uses uh, FreeBSD based appliances to serve 91 gigabits per second of SSL encrypted traffic uh, to deliver video for people watching videos off Netflix from a single processor powered machine. So FreeBSD is very good at taking bits off the disk and throwing them at the network. So getting into the history and the three different generations of FreeNAS, uh, the FreeNAS project started back in 2005 when uh, Olivier Richard LeBay started the FreeNAS project because he wanted to manage his home file server. Uh, he started it by forking a project called MonoWall, which was a FreeBSD-based firewall that was mostly written in PHP. Uh, and he took that embedded platform and rearranged it to make it uh, a, a file server. Uh, by 2006, it had won uh, VMware's Ultimate Virtual Appliance Award and was uh, voted best for a bunch of different things and on SourceForge and so on. Uh, but by 2009, uh, Olivier had stepped down. Uh, he was actually more interested in routers than file servers. He went on to create the BSD router project, which is a replacement for Cisco class routers uh, running as a BSD appliance. But uh, the then head of the project, uh, Volker Thiel, uh, announced that he no longer wanted to try to maintain FreeNAS on top of FreeBSD. He wanted to switch it to Linux. And uh, the community didn't like that idea. So this is what the first generation of FreeNAS has looked like. Uh, you know, a very 2005 web design going on there. Uh, but by 2010, IX Systems, which is a BSD-based hardware vendor, uh, took over the project. They basically provided funding for the continued maintenance of the project. And so in 2011, uh, with their developers, they released FreeNAS 8, which was then updated from FreeBSD 6 to FreeBSD 8. Uh, and they completely rewrote the middleware and the web interface using uh, Django and Python instead of PHP. And the other thing that happened around this time was ZFS was ported from Solaris, OpenSolaris, into FreeBSD. And it, by this time, it was about stable. Uh, so FreeNAS started taking advantage of that because it provided a very nice software RAID with features like copy on write, instant snapshots, and checksumming that a traditional file system like UFS just couldn't provide. By 2012, uh, FreeNAS then supported a plugin system, so you could download uh, prepackaged bundles to install applications on top of your NAS. Uh, this has since been extended further in that you can install Plex, Nextcloud, whatever you want without having to configure it manually. You just say, I want this plugin, and it downloads a pre-configured container of it and runs it on your NAS. And then allows you to stream to your TV with Plex or to have share your files via Nextcloud or there are backup tools like SpiderOak and, and uh, other cloud backup things or I think there's 25 different uh, major plugins and lots of community powered ones as well. Uh, in 2013, FreeNAS 8.3 was released uh, which was the first open source uh, storage OS to include support for native full disk encryption. Uh, so using FreeBSD's Geli disk encryption uh, and taking advantage of the ASNI instruction in modern Intel processors, you can uh, basically encrypt the entire disk with no performance penalty because with ASNI, even on a, a modest processor, the, you can encrypt eight or more 100 megabytes per second uh, per core on the machine, and so that's much faster than your spinning disks are going to be, and so it's not a performance limit at all. So you can get the same performance 
with fully encrypted drives that you got without encryption. Then in 2014, uh, FreeNAS 9.2 and 9.3, which were then updated to FreeBSD 9, included a lot of new features in ZFS that had been developed at Sun. Uh, and it had an all new volume manager to allow you to, because ZFS manages uh, file systems and so on so much differently than UFS, the wizards in volume manager and FreeNAS had to be redesigned from you know, individual disks using UFS or, or creating a, a RAID array to have one volume to create ZF, uh, UFS on. Uh, ZFS works quite a bit differently. They also changed the way the FreeNAS boots to be ZFS based. Uh, in ZFS, we have a concept called boot environments where you can take a snapshot of the working system before you install an update. And if something doesn't go well with that update from the boot menu, you can select a previous version and boot into it. But because it's copy on write, it doesn't take up a lot of extra space. Uh, and around this time, they also retired support for 32-bit hardware uh, and support for UFS. Uh, by this time, ZFS was so much better than all the other file systems that they retired support for them and allowed them to focus specifically <coughs> on ZFS instead of trying to maintain, you know, make all the features work on both the better file system and the older file system. Uh, then in 2015, they released a newer version, uh, FreeNAS 9.3.1, which is a minor update with some extra functionality based on features that have been added to ZFS in the meantime. And then last year, uh, FreeNAS 9.10 came out, which brought forward FreeNAS from FreeBSD 9 to 10.2, bringing even more features and especially uh, better support for 10, 20, and 40 gigabit Ethernet drivers. And a lot more uh, disk controllers as well. So this is what the current generation of FreeNAS looks like. Uh, we had a demo at our booth uh, downstairs earlier. And this is the basically the current generation. Don't forget that it's a dark theme. Yes. <laughs> uh, so then the third generation. Uh, <coughs> back in 2015, they started a project called FreeNAS 10. Uh, and that's why when they updated the current project to FreeBSD 10, it was called 9.10 instead of 10 because the name 10 was already taken. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that ended up being called uh, FreeNAS Corral, uh, but that didn't go very well. <laughs> uh, so it demonstrated some new ideas of how you could build uh, the GUI and how you could use containers and even support Docker on FreeBSD, but there were a lot of missing features and problems with the user experience of using it. The UI looked really nice, but when you try to create a share, uh, when you tried to share an existing directory, it created a new data set and mount point over top of it. And so it looked like it deleted all your files, even though your files were there, but they were covered up by an empty mount point and a few other problems. So uh, they've now created FreeNAS 11, which will be based on FreeBSD 11.1, which will come out later this summer. Uh, but FreeNAS 11 uh, should be finished sometime this month. Uh, and it has a new uh, user interface designed using the AngularJS. Uh, and we were also demoing that at the table. And you can see what it looks like here. Uh, the other big thing that is gained, in addition to more ZFS features like resumable replication, is uh, by switching to FreeBSD 11, they've gotten support for Beehive, uh, FreeBSD's native hypervisor. Uh, so it's now uh, able to run virtual machines of Windows and Linux and other operating systems you might want to run on top of your FreeNAS. Uh, so if you only have one machine that you want to do your virtualization and your storage, you can do it this way and get all the features of ZFS backing those VMs. So that's what the, the new UI looks like. Uh, so were there any questions about FreeNAS before I get off on a tangent here? Once a drop for support for UFS, um, it seems the big the impediment for this whole thing is that ZFS, ZFS requires as much RAM as you have storage. And so if you have 128 <laughs> gigs of storage, you need 128 gigs of RAM, and that's not real practical for us. Uh, ZFS doesn't require that much RAM. Uh, okay. at least, as long as you have about eight gigs, you can have as much storage as you want. Uh, uh, having more storage will give you a much higher cache hit ratio, and you get better performance. Uh, but in general, it's, it's one gig of RAM per terabyte of storage, not I, I, <laughs> yes. I misspoke. I yes, yes. terabytes, actually. But uh, 
that's just a rough guideline that's not required at all. I have machines with 200 terabytes and only 64 gigs of RAM, and they work perfectly fine. Uh, a lot of improvement has gone into ZFS in the meantime as well. Uh, the big reason to drop support for UFS was just that it doesn't have a lot of the capabilities and some of the features. So they build a UI that <laughs> offers you to take a snapshot, but you're using UFS, so you can't take a snapshot. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. arguing for the, su yeah. the supremacy of it. It was just the inordinate number of RAM that was required. Now I, yeah. I'm glad it's, to it's, hear that it doesn't it's require not, so much. Yes, it's not as required. It's just a, a basic guideline. And it's really geared towards people using a smaller home level where, you know, if you try to have 10 terabytes of storage and 2 gigabytes of RAM, it's not going to end well. <laughs> Although, it won't lose any data. It'll just be slow and you'll be unhappy. Any other questions about FreeNAS? Uh, our booth is in the back corner in the main room there. So if you want to actually come and play with the new UI and ask more questions about it, uh, there's be people at the booth until the end of the day. So I'm going to now talk more about ZFS, which is the file system that actually gives uh, FreeNAS most of the features it has. And it's also available uh, in FreeBSD and Illumos, but it's been ported to Linux now as well with the ZFS on Linux project. Uh, and it's used, ZFS uh, was started by Sun back in 2001 and was open sourced in 2004 uh, and has been used in production for pretty much that whole time. Uh, like uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs runs the ZFS on Linux version, and they've done a lot of the development on that. Uh, and they have 8,000 8 terabyte drives, uh, making up a number of pools they use for their supercomputer. Uh, so, some of the design goals of ZFS originally were to be the last file system you ever need. In particular, especially if you've been around since the 90s or so, you remember the pain of file systems that didn't support files larger than 2 gigabytes or didn't support volumes bigger than two terabytes. Uh, most of that came about because when you design a file system, you think, what's the most amount of storage we'll have 10 years from now? Well, that'll be the limit. Uh, and you're always wrong by a lot. <laughs> storage gets bigger a lot faster than we ever expect. Uh, so when they designed ZFS, they designed it to support uh, 256 zettabytes, which is 256 million petabytes or 256 million million gigabytes. Um, so with that, uh, with current day technology, enough hard drives to generate that amount of storage would require more energy than would boil all of the water in all the oceans on the planet. So we're okay for now. <laughs> yes, someone will do it someday. Uh, one of the important things that ZFS provides though is copy on write. So when it's writing, when you're overwriting a file, it doesn't actually overwrite it in place. It writes change blocks to a new location on the disk and then updates the metadata to point to that. The advantage to this is if you're in the middle of writing a file when the system crashes or the power goes out or something faults, uh, in a traditional overwriting file system, the first half of the original file is gone and the second half of the new file hasn't been written yet. So you have this kind of monstrosity that's a little bit of both. And usually that means your files are, that file is gone. Uh, with ZFS, because it hadn't finished writing the new file, it hadn't updated the metadata, when it boots up, it just points to the last consistent version of that file, which has the full file. The advantage of that is A, you don't lose the original version of the file, but advantage B is there's no FSCK at all. It just comes up immediately and all your files are there. You know, the file system is always consistent. Uh, it's it does transactions like a database. So it's consistent, some changes are being made, but until that transaction group is closed and all that data is flushed, if the system resets, it'll go back to the last consistent state uh, and never be inconsistent. Is that per file or multiple files? Uh, that's for the entire file system. Oh, wow. But it's actually for the entire volume uh, or the pool, which is made up of somewhere between one and 64 million data sets or file systems. Uh, the other thing it does is it checksums all the data and all the metadata. So when you write a file to ZFS, it generates a checksum. By default, it's a Fletcher 4, but you can also be SHA-512 uh, if you want. Or it also supports uh, Skeen, uh, Bruce Schneier's hashing algorithm. Uh, and so every time you read a file in the metadata, it knows what the checksum of that file should be. And it compares them. Uh, the data it read off the disk versus what it knows it wrote to the disk. 
And if it doesn't match, ZFS can use uh, its redundancy, right? If you have mirrors or RAID Z, uh, which is like RAID 5, it can read the other copy and, and correct and auto-heal the, the broken data that was returned by the hard drive that flipped a bit or, you know, there have been cases of uh, storage controllers that messed up the LBA math and actually wrote your data to the wrong sector. And so when you read from the right sector, you got back different data than you were expecting. And ZFS can detect that, and if you have some <coughs> form of redundancy, it can heal it. And because the checksum's on the metadata as well, if what, ZFS, what, if, if what the hard drive screws up is actually the checksum, the checksum of that metadata won't match its higher level checksum, and it can detect that as well. Uh, even on a single disk machine like my laptop, this provides the advantage of if the data that comes back from the hard drive is not correct, ZFS will return a read error instead of incorrect data, which can help, it stops your applications from crashing when they get unexpected input, but it also means you know that that file is wrong, right? And it actually provides status output and tells you, you know, your hard drive has corrupted this file and it has the path and file name for it and you should restore it from a backup. Uh, rather than any other file system, because it doesn't have checksums, wouldn't know and would just give you back bad data. Uh, the other thing it can do is there's an operation called a scrub. Since we check the uh, checksum of every file as we use it, but if you're doing archival storage, there may be files you wrote two years ago and have never read. So this scrub operation you can schedule, say, once a month or once a quarter, and it will read every block and verify the checksum. So we can actually detect these you know, bit rot and, and flip bits uh, early, and this can be an indication of when a hard drive is failing, but it allows you to fix it before, say, both copies, uh, both your main copy and the redundant copy go bad. So I'm just curious, does ZFS have no uh, files to protect at all? Because I know ButterFS has like similar self-healing things, but it also has an ZFS check utility, which you're supposed to not use regularly, but like will check for edge cases and stuff? Like uh, no, there is no utility at all. And we've been using it for 15 years and haven't ever needed one. Nice. Uh, there are some things that a tool like that could do, uh, in particular finding uh, problems in the space map, but there hasn't been enough need to create it yet. Uh, something else that FS can do is transparent compression. So as data is being written, it can uh, compress it. Uh, it supports a number of different compression algorithms. Uh, the default is LZ4, which is a very high speed compressor. Even on a modest laptop CPU, it can do compress about one gigabyte per second and decompress between two and four gigabyte per second per core. So if you have two or four cores on your laptop or 32 or 48 in your storage server, that's a lot of compression. Uh, and LZ4 gets about a two to one compression ratio. Or you can use something heavyweight like GZIP. Uh, you'll get something close to a three, point, uh, three to one compression ratio, but that will take a lot more CPU time. It also has smarts. It does what's called early abort. Uh, the buffer it provides to compress into is 12.5% smaller than the original. If the file won't compress enough, to, it, will, it won't save at least 12% of the space, then it doesn't store it compressed. It writes it to the disk uncompressed. That way you don't spend time compressing and decompressing files that are uncompressible. So when the file is not compressible, it just skips compression instead of wasting all your CPU time trying to compress a tar file or a tar.xz file. Uh, what's really interesting about this is when combined with very compressible content in say like a database that's full of text or uh, source code repositories and things like that, it actually allows physically impossible transfer speeds. Right? If you have a two gigabyte database and it compresses three to one down to you know, less than a gigabyte, you can write that to your disks and you just wrote two gigabytes in the amount of time it only takes to write 700 megabytes. Uh, and more importantly, when you read it back, you can decompress it, and all of a sudden, you just read two gigabytes of data off the disk in, you know, at full speed. It can only do; it would take in three times as long to read that data. So it's almost counterintuitive that enabling compression can actually lower the latency of transferring data. Uh, because ZFS is doing copy on write, and it never overwrites blocks in place, it makes it very easy to create snapshots. So when a snapshot is created, the old copy of the data is now referenced. And so when you overwrite the file, it writes any change blocks to a new location. But because a snapshot exists, it doesn't erase, it doesn't free the old blocks. 
and now you have both the new and old version of the file, or new and old version of every block. So if you only change part of a file, it doesn't have to, it only stores the new and old one, and then the common files are shared, or common blocks. So how do you deal with fragmentation then? Uh, read cache, fast drives. <laughs> um, in general, the, the, any copy on write file system is going to have some problem with uh, file fragmentation. In ZFS, the bigger concern is free space fragmentation. Uh, when you do writes to ZFS, if they're asynchronous, like if the application hasn't specifically asked for a guarantee that the data is on stable storage before you return from the write call, those uh, writes are buffered in memory and written out at the close of each transaction group, which by default is every five seconds. This allows it to write all those little bits of files as one big contiguous write, which on spinning disk allows you to get the full speed and not have to use all your IOPS seeking around. However, if you're low enough on free space and it's fragmented enough, then it has to split that large chunk of data up and move the head around to write to it. <coughs> so that's where you see the bigger performance impact is free space fragmentation rather than individual file fragmentation. Uh, part of that is ZFS has a very smart prefetch system. So when you start reading the beginning of the file, it's already finding the rest of the file and, and prepping it in the cache for you so that you don't notice the fragmentation as much. Um, what pre percentage of the disk do you start running into that problem? Like how full it, you it really depends. Uh, so in the zpool list command uh, <coughs> on modern versions of ZFS, it actually gives you a fragmentation percent number. It's mostly a wild guess, but it's based on what percentage of the available free space is made up of tiny blocks instead of big blocks. Uh, in general, you won't have any problems if you stay under 80% full. Yeah, because I know that you run into that a lot. There's a lot of file systems that the performance... <coughs> falls off a cliff when it hits... Uh, um, yeah, some that can handle 95% full, yeah. and they're fine until there, and there's a lot more of them that... Yeah. So a lot of work has gone into the performance on fragmented uh, ZFS pools, and it's gotten a lot better. Uh, it used to be, as soon as you hit 75% full, the algorithm for finding space switched, and there was a big cliff. It's much more gradual now. Um, it also depends on your files. Uh, most of the storage I do is for my video streaming company, so we have very large files, so our fragmentation level is actually very low. So running our pools to 90 plus percent full doesn't have a high performance impact on us. But on the other pools we have, which are small SSDs mirrored together, uh, we can get fragmentation a lot worse because we're constantly writing and freeing little 4K blocks. And so your free space can get really scattered in that case. Uh, one of the other features ZFS provides is replication, uh, which allows you to, with the ZFS send command, you can take a file system and serialize it into just a stream of data that you can do whatever you want with. You can write it to a tape or a file or whatever, and then at some other time, you can pipe that into ZFS receive, and it will recreate that file system. Uh, you can also do this is ZFS send pipe into SSH and ZFS receive on another machine, and now you copy that file system to the other machine. Uh, one of the main advantages to the way it does replication is because this happens at the block level underneath the file system, uh, when you want to do an incremental replication, unlike with something like rsync where you're going to walk the entire file system and stat each file and try to compare its date to the other side. Uh, with ZFS, each block that's written, part of the metadata includes the, the date uh, when that file was written, when that block was created. Well, it's actually the transaction number, but the, the time when that block was created. And so when you do incremental replication between, say, you know, Monday and Friday, you just say, show me every file that's changed since Monday, or every file that has, every block that was allocated since Monday, and it can just send that data over the stream. So it means an incremental replication can be hundreds of times faster than ZFS or er, uh, rsync because you don't have to actually check every file. You already know exactly which blocks are modified and which ones weren't. So you don't have to walk the entire file system. And so this allows you to very easily saturate 10 or 20 or 40 gigabit networks when doing replication, uh, whereas rsync was going to go a lot slower because it was just the latency of running stat on every file on both sides to compare the dates. Uh, the other interesting thing ZFS provides is RAID Z, which is its custom version of uh, RAID 5. Uh, well, it's not really RAID 5. It does um, wide stripes instead of columns. 
So when you write a 128K block to say a four disk uh, setup, it writes, or a five disk setup, it writes uh, four 32K chunks and then the parity. Uh, rather than if your swipe size is 128K on a RAID 5, you'd write 128K to each disk separately. Uh, the reason it does this is because we have a checksum and we need this whole row to never be modified in place. Uh, the main advantage this provides over something like RAID 5 is uh, it solves what's called the RAID 5 write hole. So in RAID 5, when you modify a block, you update that block, and then as the next action, you have to update the parity so that the calculation will be right. But if the power goes out in between those two steps, you've now updated the block, but the parity is wrong. And then if you have to rebuild that array, the parity won't be correct, and you'll actually lose that block, and possibly that whole row. Uh, whereas with ZFS, because of the transactional nature, that can't happen. Other things it offers, it offers uh, one, two, or three levels of redundancy. So it's like RAID 5 or RAID 6, but there's actually a triple redundancy version. Uh, and with that, you can get, you know, you can build systems that fail in place, right? Where you just, when a drive fails, you can just leave it because uh, you have three levels of redundancy. And then lastly, uh, it does something different for caching. Uh, the buffer cache in most uh, file systems is based on a LRU, least recently used. So you have a list of the files that are in your cache, and every time you use a file, it moves back to the top. And when you use a file, it's added at the top. But if there's not enough room, it deletes the files from the bottom to make room in the cache for the new file. The problem with that type of setup is scan operations, like say running an rsync backup of the whole drive, will cycle through that many times and basically the whole cache becomes useless and you get a zero cache hit ratio. With ZFS, it actually has four caches. Uh, it has a uh, most recently used, which is the same idea as an, uh, at the LRU, but then it has a most frequently used. So the files you use very frequently are in a separate cache and when you do that scan operation, you've only turned one of the caches, not all of it. And so your frequently used files will stay hot in the cache no matter what, which is really important for a database where maybe it's the log file that you're appending to that you need to always have hot in your cache. And then for each of those two, there's also a ghost list, which is uh, items that were in the cache but have fallen out, and they get temporarily blacklisted from the cache in order to allow other blocks to have a chance to try to have a, a good enough cache hit ratio to stay in the cache. And so it can adapt, it's called the adaptive replacement cache. Any questions? Sometimes, I also sometimes pipe into two copies of DD so to unblock the pipe. Uh, I prefer a program called CLP bar because I can do ZFS send minus N to get an estimate of how much data is going to be replicated and feed that to bar and it will give me a progress bar as well. As, so it's like M buffer but also with a progress bar if it knows the total size. But same idea. Uh, for a home server uh, using the gzip compression, mm -hmm. like how's that for like video streaming? Is that reasonable or is it? Uh, well, if you how have how much if power would you need to make it reasonable? Uh, if they're video files, most likely they're already compressed. Or you're doing uncompressed video. Uh, oh right, so they're already compressed. So yeah, so they're already compressed, so you're not going to get any compression gain. Like so gzip would okay. be a little painful. But lz4, you can turn on for the whole pool. And every time it tries to compress, it'll be like, oh, that's not compressible, and it'll just skip it, and you won't notice the difference uh, versus on and versus off, really. Okay. Um, is scrubbing per file? Or scrubbing is for the entire uh, pool, yeah. but every time you read a file, each block as you read it is checked. Right, a scrub is just a way to check every file, including the ones you never read. But every file is, the equivalent of a scrub happens on every file individually as you use it, every time you use it. Because you want to make sure that every time you read it off the disk, it checks the checksum. The scrub is just a way of doing it for all the files so that the files you never use have a chance to get checked. I just wondered if you could do something more selective, like you could say that certain files are more important, like multiple ones, and scrub right. uh, No. But you can, you can do it manually by just reading all the data. Oh, right, yeah. you, could, you could, you know, R sync it to dev null or something. Yeah. <laughs> more questions? Is there a specific feature you'd like me to talk more about? Um, when you were talking about uh, only 
transferring to things that, that have changed. Does mm -hmm. this make it a practical option for uh, an async between data centers? Like yes. It works, uh, it's specifically designed as the idea of doing asynchronous replication between data centers. Uh, a feature they added last year was the ability to resume one of those asynchronous replication once it gets interrupted <coughs> because I was having a lot of trouble replicating data from Toronto to Australia where it took about seven days to transfer the uh, couple of terabytes of data I was trying to push and once a week there would be a little hiccup in the route <laughs> and it would cause I'd have to start over. Uh, so now when you're doing the replication, if it's interrupted on the receive side, it gives you a token that you feed back to the send side and it picks up where it left off. One of the interesting things about the way it does replication, the ZFS send command is unidirectional. So all it does is take what you've asked for and serialize it into a format and send it out the pipe. It doesn't matter if you're receiving it now or if you're backing that up to tape and receiving it 10 years from now. Uh, there's no communication back from the receiving side at all. And so uh, that's why they had to do this little token passing thing to be able to enable the resume of the replication. So you can use that to do an initial setup where you dump it all to hard disks, FedEx yep. the hard disks. And then incrementally keep it in sync. Incremental after that. Yes. Cool. Thank you. That's how we do the 200 terabytes of backups that are in my basement. Because <laughs> <laughs> my home internet is fast, but it's not that fast. Um, so you mentioned that um, th this is available on Linux now. Yep. So I was wondering about the feasibility. Like I like to keep my personal laptop synced at all times with my home server. So would yes. I be able to run ZFS on my laptop yep. and then have it? That's what I do when I go to conferences. I have uh, a set of data sets where I do all my software development. So it's like 10 SVN checkouts of FreeBSD and a bunch of other projects. And before I leave the, for the conference, I create a new snapshot called before name of conference incrementally replicate that to my laptop, go to the conference, work off my laptop for the couple days, and then create a new snapshot on the laptop called after conference and send it back to my file server, and now my file server has all my data and I go back to working off my file server instead of my laptop. Cool. So yes, that works very well. <laughs> <laughs> I depend on that one. Now, we didn't talk about hardware rate. Uh, so the problem with trying to use hardware RAID in combination with ZFS is what hardware RAID normally does is take all your disks and make it look like one virtual disk. Because most file systems like <coughs> VXT3 and 4 and UFS can't work across more than one disk. Uh, but if you do this to ZFS, the problem you have is there's only one disk now, so ZFS has no place to store a second copy of data, right? Like a, if you had a mirror, if you use ZFS to do a mirror or a RAID 5. Um, ZFS, for your laptop especially, has an option where there's each data set you create has a property called copies, and it defaults to one, but you can set it to two or three, and any data you write to that particular data set will have two or three copies of the data stored in different places on the disk. So that if it's just a single bad sector that corrupted your file, ZFS has another copy to read it from. Of course, it means every file takes up two or three times as much space. But on a laptop where it's not possible to put, you know, five <coughs> disks and create a nice RAID Z, uh, it's an interesting option. Uh, and if you're stuck working with uh, uh, a SAN as your source or something where you don't control the RAID underneath, it's one of the options. Can you just say real quick again how, how do you enable that? Or what enable was the which? feature? Oh, uh, it's called copies. So on each, uh, this is why you need checks on it. A single bit flip on the hard drive, and all of a sudden your JPEG doesn't look right anymore. Um, so in ZFS, you have a pool of storage made up of all the space from all the drives, and you create multiple virtual file systems on top of that. And those are the POSIX file systems that you have access to uh, when you create them. Each of those has a set of properties that you can control, like whether it does compression or not, and which algorithm it uses, uh, what checksum it uses. And one of the options is copies. And you can set it to one, two, or three, and every data block, user data block will be stored that many times. Um, you can also use those properties to control whether it's shared over NFS or not, or Samba or not, and uh, lots of other features on there. Uh, you can control the case sensitivity of individual file systems that way even. So if you have to support Windows, you have the option of actually creating a case insensitive file system for one set of data, uh, and so on. You can also control the caching. 
Um, how do you, uh, how would you recommend uh, administering uh, users and permissions over uh, shared network ZFS file system? So uh, ZFS has support for NFS v4 ACLs, and if you plug that in with Samba, you can actually manage it from Windows even. Uh, but NFS v4 ACLs are supported by Linux and BSD and, and Illumos, and by a Samba you can extend it into Windows, so it's the easiest way to, to control the, the permissions on the files. Because I've, I've had some issues with trying to use um, FTP. Mm -hmm. I will try and copy a file over there, and it will, or a folder full of files, and it will create a new, uh, new folder, mm -hmm. but then when it tries to uh, copy the files, it says permission denied. Yeah, that would be the uh, ACL inheritance on the parent directory. You have to, uh, in the NFSv4 ACLs, there's one ACL entry that controls what newly created directories will have as their permissions, and it right. must and not I'll, be I'll too tight. That, okay. But then it will work for the next file created, but then after that, it permission denied again. Hmm. It always reverts, it's always seeming to want to revert back. And that's ZFS on which platform? Which platform is that on? Uh, Ubuntu. Okay. It doesn't happen to me on BSD. <laughs> no, no, sorry. <laughs> ACLs are kind of specific to each OS. So. You mentioned being able to put more than one thing on there, um, mm -hmm. hypothetically, yep. uh, virtual machines and so forth. Does the performance drop off uh, smoothly as you start to consume clocks with something else? Or is there something like a cliff where so above a certain You mean point? like for CPU usage? Yeah, for, uh, CPU for your is NFS file system. Or, uh, I mean, not, right. not your, your yeah. ZFS. So uh, ZFS uses scalable data structures so that the number of data sets you create or even the number of snapshots doesn't impact your performance. So unlike LVM, having 10,000 snapshots isn't going to make it crawl. Um, and then CPU usage uh, by ZFS is generally quite low other than if you're using GZIP. Uh, and so, and it's done in the kernel with a higher priority, so it's, it's usually fine. Uh, it also purposely runs fewer threads than you have CPUs, so that it won't, like, live lock your system when you're trying to do compression and so on. I had lots of slides, I didn't know how long we would take. Uh, so this is the, the first book I wrote. It's about 200 pages. You can get the DR DRM free ebook from zfsbook.com, or you can get the print edition off Amazon or Gumroad or wherever you want to buy a book. Uh, but it talks about how to pick the right hardware to get the best performance out of ZFS, how to configure those data sets and adjust the properties like the copies and the uh, compression and so on, and uh, how to deal with once a disk fails, how you manage that, or how to expand your pool by adding more disks. Um, when they designed ZFS, their goal was, you know, when you want to add more RAM to a server, you just plug it in and reboot. You don't have to run RAM admin and do a bunch of stuff to start using that extra RAM. It's just there. Uh, with ZFS, they wanted to get as close to that as possible for storage. And so you just add more disks and just say zpool, add these disks to the pool, and you have that extra space and it's ready to go. You don't have to do anything else. Curveball time. Yes. Postgres related. Yes. One, tuning, second, auto backing. Right. Uh, so tuning is advanced ZFS. There's an entire <laughs> chapter on Postgres and an entire chapter on MySQL and MariaDB. Uh, the main thing is one of the properties you can set on ZFS is the record size. Uh, and this, the default's 128, but on a database uh, where you're going to have four, uh, 8 or 16K records being written, you end up with write amplification because you're going to have to read the whole 128k block, change the middle 16k, and then write it back. And you don't want that, so you shrink the, uh, the block size. Uh, this can have an impact if you're using RAID Z uh, on ZFS, because in order to avoid a type of fragmentation where you would never be able to use your free space, uh, right? if you have an individual sector and you're using RAID Z where you need to write the sector and the, the parity for it, if you ever end up with a single sector left somewhere, you would never be able to use it because you couldn't write the data and the parity together. Uh, so it rounds up to the nearest power of n plus 1, uh, which is the number of drives you have plus the level of parity. Uh, so if you're using RAID Z and very small record size to do Postgres or uh, you know 4K record size for VMs, uh, you can end up taking up more space than you thought because of the padding it uses in RAID Z. But if you want high performance for uh, databases or VMs, 
sets of mirrors in a, like a Ray 10 configuration is always much faster if you get more IOPS that way. But also in regards, um, how, uh, how do you see performance in regards to vacuum? Vacuum. Yeah. Yes. Um, deletes can be a little slow on ZFS sometimes, <laughs> especially when you're freeing up a lot of space at once. Um, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer to that one. Sorry. But uh, there's lots of Postgres tuning in the, the advanced ZFS book. Uh, and if you're really new to file systems, there's uh, my co-author also has a couple other books, including uh, Storage Essentials, which covers the basics of how disk works and how to partition them and so on. Uh, they're a bit specific to FreeBSD, but the two ZFS books, while they say FreeBSD Mastery in the title, the ZFS command line is the same on Linux, uh, BSD, and Lumos. So, and even the tuning, the variables and so on are the same, just they're in a slightly different location on Linux than they are on BSD. Uh, so the ZFS books work very well even on Linux. Is, are there provisions in FreeNAS to identify speed of disks? So you have a spinning pool and a SSD pool? or You have to do that manually when you create, uh, when you add disks to I mean, there's a, pool. a way to say these yes. are fast and these aren't. Well, you can create two different pools, one okay. for the fast disks and one for the slow disks. Okay. Although uh, fast disks can be used to augment uh, a slower pool as special types of devices. Like I said, the log device, what it does is when you do uh, synchronous writes where the application is asking for a guarantee, it goes to the SSD first and then gets flushed out to the, the spinning disks later when it's not as important. Uh, or there's the L2 arc. So you remember the arc is the memory cache that it has where it has the four lists. But when data no longer fits in there, when a data is going to age out of there, Instead of just throwing it away, what it can do is write it to your L2 arc, your level 2 arc, the SSD. And that way, you can still get uh, faster reading off the SSD than you're going to get off the spinning disk, allowing you to expand the size of your cache once you know it's not possible to put more RAM in the server. And another new feature that recently came out is the compressed arc. If the blocks are compressed on disk, with this feature, it now leaves them compressed in memory and then decompresses them as you use them. Because, like I said, LZ4 can decompress at many gigabytes per second per core. Uh, so, especially with a database like Postgres, if you're getting two, three, or four, or six to one compression, you're, now your memory cache can hold six times more. And all of a sudden, the advice uh, about uh, MySQL of disabling caching and using the, you know, the buffer cache in MySQL, instead you say, no, let me do it myself because I can compress it. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, using. and let the ARC cache it, especially if you're getting you know, very much compression. Uh, when the authors originally created that feature, they had a customer that had a, about a one terabyte database, but the most RAM they could fit in their server was 768 meg, uh, gigs of RAM. And so they were, you know, any stuff that didn't fit in the cache was having really terrible performance. But the database compresses three to one. <laughs> All of a sudden, they're only using 400 gigs of their 768 gigs of RAM, and they have a 100% cache hit ratio. And so their database is operating out of RAM, but is still safe storage as well. Good so if I had uh, one really trivial one, uh, mm -hmm. trim, how do you guys handle that in SSDs? So yes. So in ZFS proper, there's no trim support yet, but there's an outstanding pull request where the feature is being worked on. In FreeBSD specifically, we've had our own trim feature in ZFS for a while. So if your underlying devices are SSDs, when you add them to the pool, it trims the range of bytes that you add to the pool. So if you ran, use a partition, it doesn't delete the entire device on you. But it uh, starts out in a known good state of all the sectors are unallocated. And then what it does is when you free a block, it waits for 32 transactions. And if the block's not been reallocated by that time, then it sends a trim down, it queues a trim to the drive to free up that space. And then the second one, uh, this is way a field one, sorry. Mm -hmm. How would you compare or contrast something like OpenNDN Well, ZFS is ZFS across all of them. Uh, the differences are the other tools you get. Yeah. Uh, I think our in SCSI, our in kernel SCSI, uh, iSCSI server is a bit faster because it's newer. Uh, 
And especially if you're a Linux user, uh, on FreeBSD, if you type top, top comes up. And on OpenIndiana, it's like PR stat or something, right? Um, the artwork for these two books was, I forget the artist's name, but they're inspired by classical paintings. This one was like a lady on a bicycle being chased or whatever, <laughs> and we replaced it with Beastie. And then this one is um, St. Bartholomew and the Devil or something it was called. Uh, this is actually a wraparound cover that the other half of the picture is on the back. I didn't bring a copy to show, but uh, this is, there's a, guy dressed as like a, a bishop or something on the other side and he's getting the, the secret knowledge from the devil. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about uh, open DFS on Linux. Mm -hmm. what is the, how is the light difference? I know there is... So when Sun open sourced ZFS, they did it under a license called the CDDL, the Common Development Something License, yeah. which is basically a slightly modified version of the Mozilla public license that Firefox is under. Um, it includes a provision that allows you to take its source code, compile the binary, and license that binary however you want, including under the GPL. The problem is the GPL says that if you license the binary under GPL, you have to license <laughs> the source code under the GPL, and that doesn't quite work. So on FreeBSD with our two-clause BSD license, it's no problem to have it. Uh, Canonical says it's fine to have ZFS on Linux, so. No one sued them yet. <laughs> but if you're worried about it, just use FreeBSD. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it doesn't look, it's at the block level, so by this point, it doesn't, the file name is not associated with the data. Um, one interesting thing I personally have been working on is the, the person who created LZ4 uh, was then later hired by Facebook and has released a new compression standard called uh, Z Standard. Oh, I read about that. It's supposed to be yeah. awesome. Uh, so it gets compression ratios like gzip, but like four to eight times faster. Uh, so while it's not gigabytes per second per core like LZ4 is, it's 400 plus megabytes per second per core, which as long as you have a decent number of cores compared to the number of spinning disks you have, uh, it'll be fast enough where you still will not be bottlenecked by the compression. Uh, so hopefully by the end of this year, ZFS will support that as an option as well, which will suddenly give you three to one compression instead of two to one compression on your compressible data uh, without being a CPU hog like GZIP is. So you get GZIP levels of compression, but a lot faster. And also, if you, you know, GZIP supports nine levels of compression. So far, Z standard supports 22. <laughs> and I've read the blog post on it. Yeah. A lot of times, Z standard is like level two is the better than GZIP minus nine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and with the the performance actually has gone quite a bit up since the original 1.0.0 uh, with the new like I think it's one one four now. Uh, I think we're out of time. Ish, but I can take more questions for a minute, and if not, I'll be at the FreeBSD booth in the corner in the main room. <laughs>